Do you have items in your home that at one point were useful, but now you question why you ever bought them in the first place? Okay, or maybe you don't question why, but you keep lying to yourself that one day you'll actually open them up and use them. Okay, our family loves to go treasure hunting at secondhand stores. And you'd be amazed at the things that you'll find at a Goodwill store that are still brand new in the box, like never opened, but somehow deemed not useful. And the joy that you experience, or I experience, when I find something that someone else deemed not useful, that has now become my treasured item. Hey, for example, I'm just getting into roasting my own coffee beans. I know, I'm like way down the rabbit hole of coffee. And the tool that I use to roast is this old school hand crank popcorn popper. Okay, nobody really uses those anymore. And I'm sure there are tons of those that I've, at least I found sitting in secondhand stores, or maybe it's gathering dust in one of your kitchen cabinets. But that obsolete tool has become a treasured tool for, for my exploring of the world of freshly roasted coffee. And today's passage will include two everyday things that we encounter that are useful only as we put them to use. And we're continuing in our series through the New Testament book of Matthew, and we're now entering into a really important section uh, of Matthew's account of Jesus's life and ministry, known simply as the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a collection of teachings from Jesus that sort of center on what life in God's kingdom looks like. See, Jesus is portraying the good life, the blessed life, life that is found in obedience to God's kingdom mission and values. And last week, all of you, all of our home churches met and walked through a discipleship tool called Discovery Bible Study, or DBS. And it's something we're exploring as a church, a tool that we can implement at times to help you and me dig more fully into God's Word, to allow the Spirit of God, right, who leads us into truth to serve as the teacher of a passage. And we all developed personal I will statements in response to what we felt God was teaching us. And I, I hope you had a chance to engage in DBS last week and were challenged as God spoke uniquely to you and through you. And as part of your home church gathering today, hey, make sure to take time to review those I will statements from last week and how living into those went. Today's message is just going to pick up right from where your home church left off. From the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 1 to 11, now we're continuing to look at a few more keys to being a disciple of Jesus. In fact, if we could kind of sum up or wrap up the whole of the Sermon on the Mount in, in one phrase, I like this phrase from theologian R.T. France. He calls it the discourse on discipleship. It's a guide on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what we're learning about today. And if I could sum up the message in a big idea, it would be this. Now, we are called to be like salt and light. We are called to be like salt and light. Okay, both of these items or tools are, are found in our everyday lives, but in order for them to be effective, right, they have to be actively put into use. So let's jump into the passage today and see what Jesus has to say about these two everyday items. And we'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says this, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Hey, the first tool that Jesus utilizes in defining what a disciple looks like is salt. Hey, what is salt used for? Well, well, first off, I would just encourage you, if you like going down rabbit trails on the internet, uh, do a quick Google search on the, the idea of salt or, or the, the history of salt, and you'll come across zillions of articles that show our complicated history as humans with salt. It's actually pretty fascinating. In fact, one of the things I found out, and you'll love this, is during the Roman Empire, which was around the time that Jesus spoke these words, salt was such a valuable commodity that soldiers received payment in the form of salt instead of money. The high value once attributable to salt is preserved in the English word salary, which contains the Latin root sol or salt, okay, which explains, if you've ever heard this phrase, like when something is worth their salt, and that's what we're talking about. And who knew something so valuable lives on our dining room tables? So to try and kind of summarize this varied history of salt, there were kind of three main uses in the ancient world. And the first is this flavoring, okay, duh, right? Salt is a universal flavor enhancer because at low concentrations, it will reduce bitterness, sour, 
you know, umami taste, but increase sweet. It's like when you're baking cookies or cakes and it right, calls for just a pinch of salt. But if you put higher concentrations, the opposite is true. Salt can actually suppress sweetness and enhance the umami, the salty flavors, which, which is good for savory dishes. And then kind of to top it all off, salt also reduces the activity of water in food, thereby kind of concentrating the flavors, right? All that goodness comes from salt, right? It's, it's a flavor enhancer. So salt can be used to flavor food. A, a second way it was used more so in the ancient world was for preserving. The ancient Egyptians were the first to realize the preservation possibilities of salt. So sodium, one of those core aspects of salt, draws bacteria causing moisture out of foods, drying them out and making it possible to store meat without, a, without refrigeration for extended periods of time. And this would have been revolutionary before there was red, refrigeration like we have today. They think of those who lived as nomads or traveled long distance on things like ships, right? Salt allowed you to preserve your meat for the journey. And another fun fact from my Google search, in case salt worked so well at preserving <laughs> that the Egyptians also used it to mummify people. I mean, there you go. That was free. So salt could be used to preserve things. And a third way it was commonly used, both in the ancient world and for today also, is medicinal purposes. Hey, think gargling salt for a sore throat or Epsom salt baths for sore muscles. Okay, salt doesn't just make your food tastier. It's actually required for life. Sodium ions help the body perform a number of basic tasks, include maintaining the fluid in blood cells and helping the small intestine absorb nutrients. You listen, we can't make salt in our own body, so we have always, as humans, always had to look to the environment around us to fill that need. And Jesus, he referenced this everyday tool, but he, he did so in an unexpected way. He said that his followers are the salt of the earth. Right, those are his disciples are to be like salt. And based on what we now know about salt, right, how could that help us understand this in a few different ways? Right? I think in all three of these uses of salt that we've pointed to, we can see how Jesus might be calling us as disciples to bring that into the world. Right? Disciples of Jesus should enhance the world around them. Right? We should bring the God flavors into the world. It should mean something that, that you work where you do, where you live, where you do, where your home church meets where it does. And I know we've talked about this before, but it should mean something to this neighborhood around the building, right? That our, our building is here, right? God's goodness and love should be made visible. And I've already kind of alluded to it, but I love the way the message translation picks up on this. And this is again, Matthew 5, 13 out of the message or MSG, if we want to, you know, keep in the salt theme. Here's what it says is, let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. We are meant to bring out the God flavors of this earth. In any situation, you and I, spirit-empowered people, have the ability to enhance, to draw out the goodness of God if we will step out. They also, right, disciples of Jesus should preserve the world around them. Another way we can understand Jesus' call is, right, is our understanding of salt as a preservation tool. The followers of Jesus should partner with God's Spirit to push back the darkness, right, like the bacteria-filled moisture in meat. And in places and situations where things are broken or, or sin-stricken, disciples of Jesus can bring light and hope. But what I don't think Jesus is saying is that we should somehow kind of hold on or try to preserve the holy huddle that we have until he returns, right? That's not what he means by preservation. That's equivalent to leaving the salt in the shaker and, and never choosing to utilize this amazing tool that we've been given. And finally, disciples of Jesus should bring healing to the world around them. And just as salt has the ability to disinfect, to bring peace into sore muscles, so followers of Jesus should be those who carry God's peace his restorative power into the world around them. Intense relationships, God's spirit in you can bring out peace and healing. In broken lives, the salt of our lives in Jesus can bring about a way to be set free and made new. And all this is possible as we choose to follow Jesus into the world around us, right? But for salt to be effective, it has to be what? It has to be poured out. If it never gets out of the salt shaker, it will be exactly as Jesus warns. It'll be worthless. And unlike the salt on our tables today, ancient days of mining salt produced 
a, a less pure form of salt that over time, like with the impurities also in it, could literally have the saltiness leached out of it. Then what is it good for, right? It's nothing, right? It's meant to be thrown away. And so the point of Jesus' metaphor of salt has, it's not so much to do with how we understand our purpose as salt, but rather our effectiveness as his followers. You see, there is so much potential in salt. But unless it's put into use, it doesn't matter, right? Unless it's put in out there into the world, right? It, right? It's not something we naturally have in us, but unless we, we put it into the world, it won't ever be effective. Furthermore, if we dig a bit into the Greek, we can kind of better understand Jesus' warning. Okay, the phrase, lose its saltiness, shows up four times in the New Testament. But the more common meaning is this, is to make or become foolish. So more than just being poured out, we can see Jesus saying it's actually our foolishness that can actually lead to ineffectiveness. And we've all heard someone who was unwilling to come to Jesus, not because of what he said or claimed to do, but because of the foolishness of his followers. It's actually, sometimes it's the people of God who can limit the effectiveness of the gospel, not the gospel itself. So don't forget who you and I are called to be as followers of Jesus. We are called to be like salt, to be those who bring out the God flavors in the world around us. And then Jesus continues with, with another metaphor. We'll pick up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The second tool that Jesus connects to his followers is light. And we've discussed before the reality of both light and darkness, right? When we see darkness, what we're only seeing is actually the lack of light. Darkness doesn't exist on its own. It's merely the absence of light. And Jesus gives us these three different images that illustrate the impact of light on darkness. He talks about a city on a hill, right, whose lights are visible in the dark. He also talks about a small kind of terracotta bull oil lamp, which gives light to a dark room. Then also a light is a metaphor for good works, which are designed to shine and not be hidden. And I, I look at these, there's almost a movement to these images, right? Jesus first begins with this city, right? Something collective. And that's us, Oasis, right? Y'all are the light of the world. This is a collective thing, meant to shine as light in the midst of a dark and broken world. And that is something we as home churches should be about, right? It's collectively what God does through us as we are obedient to his call and choosing to love one another. When we look at the brokenness of our world how divisive we can be as people, right? How bright might the church shine if we were unified in love for one another? I think of Jesus' call in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 35. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, my followers, right? It's our love that shines brightly. The ways that we choose to walk alongside one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is that our home churches will be marked by genuine love. Will we not choose to get through our home church gatherings, but will we take the time to truly show love and care to others in our home church? But then Jesus takes this image of a city and then that gets distilled down into our individual lives. We're each called to be light in the places we reside, right? Jesus compares it to a small lamp that gives light to a house. Light is only effective if it's put into use, right? If you take a candle and then place a bowl over it, what's, what's going to happen, right? It's going to get snuffed out. You're going to snuff out that light. In fact, Jesus says you don't place it under a bowl, but you put it on a stand. You elevate it to give light to the whole house, right? Just as when you go camping, right? You, you hang that lantern up high so that it lights up the whole campsite. So as we kind of are elevated that way, that, that light will dispel the darkness, and if you've ever been to a concert or a sporting event, there's always like that one moment that they lower the lights and they have everybody turn on their cell phone lights to fill that dark room with light. And before cell phones, I guess they used lighters, which just really sounds like a not great idea. <laughs> but it's amazing to see the power of thousands of individual lights that come together, right? It can light up even the vast dark place. And, and that's the power we carry as vessels of God's light. We each can light up the everyday places where God's Spirit leads. 
And then we collectively can be like a city on a hill. But, but what's the point? Right? Jesus gives us the how and why in verse 16. Let me read these verses again. Uh, and then again, the message translation, it says this. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm going to put you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Right? How do we shine? What does it say here? Right? Be generous with our lives. What the NLT, the other translation that we use, says good deeds. As we serve in God's love, as we live in his grace, the world around us can't help but take notice. And then who will they really see, right? This is the why. It says you'll prompt people to open up to God. They'll give praise and honor to him. When we talk about good deeds, it can be easy to just sort of slip into a religious way of living. And that can kind of have a negative connotation to it. We can begin to see our good deeds as the reason that we're accepted by God, right? We serve to be worthy of his love, but that's not at all what Jesus is talking about here. Our motivation to generosity with our lives is that others would receive the life that we've come to find in Jesus. It's, it's an overflow of our hearts, a desire to make God's love known far and wide. Or as that message translation says, we have this generous father in heaven that motivates our personal generosity. And I came across an article from Pastor Mark DeMaz that talks about the power of being light in the 21st century. Let me read this for you. It says, in the 20th century, the way people were drawn to the church and ultimately to Christ was through a clear explanation of the gospel. Yet, in the 21st century, people are not so much drawn to Christ by explanation, but by what? Demonstration. Not so much, not so so much to what Christians say, but to what we do and how we live individually and collectively via the local church. To reach these generations like the nuns who walked away from Christ, the nuns who have been in church but have said they're done with that, and others wanting nothing to do with Christianity or the church. Okay, we should recognize the 21st century is a Matthew 5:16 century. I love that. Okay, a Matthew 5:16 century. Right? It's choosing to move beyond talk alone and to live according to God's power. Or as the Apostle Paul said so well in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Oasis, let's be those who move merely beyond good intentions and step into Jesus' call to be like salt and light. And let's choose to be salt. To bring those who bring out the God flavors, right? The flavors, the God seasoning in the places that we find ourselves in. Okay, the Holy Spirit is always working and we're called to partner with him. So let's be attuned to his working and call it out, right? Let's be those who preserve, who push back the corrosive works of the enemy, who walk in peace and seek to heal and restore. And on top of that, like, let's also choose to be light, right? Both in the way we choose to live generously together as home churches and then, and then the individual everyday places that God has placed us. Let your lives speak of the goodness of God. Love in radical ways. Be generous with your lives so that a Matthew 5, 16 century can see Jesus clearly and give him praise. But this only happens as we choose to be useful, as we choose to step out. And I pray we all respond to Jesus' call for his followers to be like salt and light. As I wrap up this message, I have just a few next steps for us. And the first is become a follower of Jesus. And the amazing thing about Jesus' call to be salt and light is that he was and is the perfect representation of both. Jesus was the salt of the earth who came to bring about God's kingdom to display God's love in, tan in a tangible way and his good deeds shine a light on what God's heart is for, right? You and me. Jesus is the ultimate preserver. His death on the cross and resurrection, defeating sin, death, and the powers of evil. And that's available to you and me. He came not to condemn the world, but to save the world through his sacrifice. And if you long to receive the gift of life in God's kingdom that Jesus came to bring, 
Would you let someone in your home church know? We'd love to pray for you and help you take next steps in what it means to follow Jesus. The second step is pretty straightforward. Be salt and light. If you long to be followers of Jesus, then our desire should be that our lives would be like salt and light. I mean, not for our own glory or acclaim, but so that people would experience the God flavors and see our generous Father in heaven. And I would challenge you to make space this week to ask God how you could be salt in your workplace or in your home or in your neighborhood, somewhere that God has placed you. And with that, also how could you serve through, serve there in generosity, right? Your light on full display. I know God answers that prayer and Jesus' desire is that we would be useful with what he has given us. And the last next step is this, practice Lent. We are coming into our second week of Lent, the season of preparation for Easter. And I would encourage you to consider or continue in some sort of practice in leading up to again, celebrating Jesus as King at Easter. I've decided to step away personally from social media and some other things on my phone in order to make room for more of God. Is there similar ways that maybe he is calling you to step into a practice of preparation like that? Maybe removing some of the noise so that you and me can again be ready to receive Jesus as King. Have a blessed week and be like salt and light. Okay, God bless Oasis.